Good morning, folks. It is the morning of October the 20th, 2020. And uh, I, I think we'll continue today with trying to make sense of last week's trilogy. The first in that series why, is why we all must play by the same rules. The second was playing by the rules reprise. And then the third and final one from last week was the Grand Narrative Structures, Constraints, and Possibilities. I think one of the things that I had been doing poorly is keeping continuity in each video and trying to draw further conclusions in each vlog. So basically, last week's premise is this, and I'll recap very, very quickly, as concisely as I, I am able to. Games have rules. The game that's played cooperatively, using those rules, will always outcompete a game that's played by coercion even if the stated goal of the game is the same. The rules which constrain the game make the game itself possible. Without those rules, the constraints that allow a game to be played iteratively over time by everyone becomes impossible. This is one of the great faults that I have with those who call themselves libertarians because they got the part of free market individual economic liberty correct but they didn't get the part correct about the laws which must constrain the game of economic engagement with others in other words simply put free people can only trade freely with other free people. If you're trading with other nations that have centrally planned economies, particularly with totalitarian nations whose government is injecting huge amounts of resources taken from the trade that they're engaging with the Western, the free Western world, and interfering in people's individual right to pursue economic liberty, then you're not trading freely with them. You're trading under constraints that don't follow the rules of the game. That is, if you value freedom. And since we live at a time where in my 67 years, I'm now in the 68th year of my life. In my 67 years, since 1953, I cannot remember another time when our liberties and our inherent rights were under such an attack, not just here in Canada, but all throughout the Western world. I've often mentioned that I kind of woke up in Norway. I became horrified when I saw the results of Yenteloven on that society. And Yenteloven is a doctrine common throughout Scandinavia that forces social conformity. Let's look at it. There's ten rules to Yenteloven. The town of Yenta was a fictitious town in Denmark. And it was, uh, well, I'll read about it. Sandemosa was the Danish Norwegian author that came up with a compilation of these rules by observing how society functioned in the village where he grew up. That village was called Nikobling, Nikobing. Moors, and he renamed that village Yenta in his novel about 
the, the law of Yenta, which is what Yenta Loven means. Loven in Norwegian means the law. So here are the ten rules of Yenta Loven that are absolutely soul crushing and form the petri dish in which the bacteria of socialism can thrive. Rule one, you're not to think you're anything special. Rule two, you're not to think you're as good as we are. Rule three, you're not to think you're as smarter than we are. Rule four, you're not to imagine yourself better than we are. Rule five, you're not to think you know more than we do. Rule six, you're not to think you are more important than we are. Rule seven, you're not to think you're good at anything. Rule eight, you're not to laugh at us. Rule nine, you're not to think anyone cares about you. And rule 10, you're not to think you can teach us anything. Under such constraints, the lowest common denominator will always emerge on top because it crushes any possibility for individuality and therefore achievement. Of course, we live in an age where the constant harp on diversity refuses to recognize that the most diversity occurs on the individual level. There are far more diversity between individuals, even within a group, than there are between groups. So when the government talks about diversity, it's not talking about diversity amongst individuals. It's talk, talking about diversity among groups of individuals. And that we're to apply this gentilovanistic law that all groups are of equal value, which is another nonsensical idea that's come literally right out of cultural Marxism that there is no hierarchy of values that we can assign. So, playing by the same rules. As we engage in a game, playing by the same rules, that game is always targeted. Why? Because we're moving creatures. In our hands, perceive the world as tools. Everything around me, I see as a tool that I'm currently using, and the things that I don't see as tools, I simply ignore at the moment. Right now I'm only focused on the tools to make this morning's vlog. A game that's truly admired, instinctively admired, involves targeting. We're moving creatures, we have hands, we're firing something toward a target. What that target becomes determines the nature of the story we're telling. So here we are, there you go, there you're going. How do we establish the a priori needs to determine what target we're aiming for? When we hit the target, we experience positive emotion. And when we're impeded along the way, we experience negative emotion. And the hero in that story is the one who, as an individual, encounters great resistance, is heading toward noble goals, and in spite of all the resistance, still achieves them or refuses to be destroyed or refuses to accept the impediment. They find a way to push through to achieve success. Those are the people that we always ignore. Therefore, the very nature of a hero in a story is the person that in spite of all odds achieves their, their ends, the ends to their noble goal. And the very nature of a villain, and you notice this applies in movies when, when stories about villains are told. Thieves most often operate in gangs, and they're headed toward a very ignoble goal. 
And even within that gang, they're usually jerking one another over because, of course, the rules that constrain their game are not based on the universal human rules of fairness and reciprocity. Today, we see individual economic liberty at greater risk than ever before, and all for one simple reason, that the central planners in all the governments throughout the West are acting as villains to constantly interfere with the economy as they establish ignoble goals, preventing the individual from succeeding at their maximum potential. Last week we talked about the Pareto Principle, the 80-20 rule, where 20% of people in society, in a business, in a company, are doing 80% of the work. That's a mathematical principle. It's also called the Matthew Principle, from the book of Matthew. To him much is given, much more will be given, that kind of thing. And to him who is little, it will be taken away. And of the 20% that's doing 80% of the work, that 20% very often owns 80% of the wealth. And of that 20%, 80% of its wealth is owned by 20% of them, and 80% of the work within the 20% is done by 20% of the 20%. This unrestrained need for interference to create what the government calls equity, what socialists call equity, can never achieve their stated goals. Even within a socialist system, the wealthiest people are the ones that are involved in state interference. When we traveled through China in 2009, we were wined and dined by two categories of people, and they were in bed with one another. There was the CCP on one hand, and the triads on the other. Very often, they were even the same people. Because socialism is unfair, and it creates arbitrary rules for playing the game, and it's not played cooperatively, because it happens under totalitarian coercion, you have nothing but corruption. And now we see that emerging in Canada today, where we have the most corrupt government Canada has ever seen. I posted today on Facebook, I'll read it to you, give me a second to get there. Because this shows you how far down the tubes we are. Come on, open up. This is what I wrote this morning. The sad thing about this mem, this is a mem, and it shows Harper on top. Canada was the first G7 country to recover from the 2008 crisis. This was in 2010. 2020, Canada has the highest unemployment rate in the G7. Now, here's what's truly sad about this mem. The sad thing about this mem is that even Harper believed in planned economies and bailouts while defending his government's intervention in rewarding the big banks for their corruption. By that rather obvious measure, Harper was a socialist although not as radical a one as the current cadre of neo-Marxists in power. So the question remains, and this is the question I'm posing to my listeners. I want you to answer this for me, because I don't have an answer. I don't see how this game can be played without answering this question. The question remains, how will Canada be rid of its romance with enormous interventionist government? 
I don't think it can. Keynesian economics on LSD are being applied in ever greater measure than Keynes himself would have dared, while Mises is utterly forgotten and or ignored. We have a government interfering in every cloying aspect of human affairs, even making us cover our faces. Here's another question that I have for you, and I hope someone can answer. If masks prevent COVID-19, which I call the CCB, CCP virus, how is it that people who wear them are getting infected and infecting others if masks were an effective method of prevention or deterrence. I don't understand. I'm a stupid man. I need someone to explain. Obviously, the government is creating panic. They're doing it deliberately. And they're doing it for one simple reason. Control of the outcome of the game where they, the clever ones, the wealthy elite, can use our economy to fund their corrupt, immoral, and villainous lifestyle. Remember the biblical meaning of the word sin to miss the target? There's nothing noble being played in the game that's governing society today. This is the most ignoble and perverse time in human history, where all values that upon which Western liberal democracy since the age of enlightenment is founded are being trashed and trampled underfoot. Someone needs to tell me how on earth we can move forward cooperatively when all the government does is coerce. And now you see these protests going on throughout Canada. People are enraged. I was down at the protest on Parliament Hill last month, or September, I believe it was, early September. Parliament Hill was awash with people who are totally fed up with statism. But the sad thing about them is, is that even they favor an interventionist government. I don't think there's any folks among them who really understand limited constitutional government and laissez-faire free market individual economic liberty. This is also indica indicative of the fact that our schools have been utterly corrupted by radical postmodern lefties who have filled kids' head, heads with this belief that the socialist collective is able to care for the needs of the many while ignoring utterly the heroic individual. Thanks for listening today. I really want to engage all of you in a conversation. There are no bad answers to my questions. I don't know what the answers are, but I fear further deterioration in society. I'm watching things around me collapse and, uh, as I said last week, Yaihar Fatnak, I have had enough. I just had enough. I don't want to see this anymore. This is not the country in which I was born. Have a great day.